Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for tonight's event with Dr. Richard Schuldiner. The title of his presentation is Low Vision Testing, Producing Patient Results and Financial Success. I'll be your host tonight. My name is Dr. Arielle Serenzi. So it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight, Dr. Richard Schuldiner. Um, he's lectured all over the world, including Russia, China, Africa, Israel, and then of course, all over the United States. And now we're lucky enough to have him in our living room or office, wherever you may be. Um, but he is uh, graduated from Salis University in 1970. Uh, first started off in a nonprofit with uh, Lighthouse, which you all may have heard of, and um, then decided he wanted to take this low vision specialty into a private practice setting and be able to make some money. And uh, he's going to be able to walk us through how to practice uh, all of the low vision uh, best practices and how to have fin financial success doing so. Um, his practice is the Schuldiner Low Vision Training Institute, and he's had a low vision only practice for about 25 years now. So we are truly hearing from the pro. I'm going to have you go ahead and take it away from here. Well, hello, doctors. Thank you for taking the time to actually uh, be on a low vision uh, lecture, which is uh, always exciting for me. And uh, having been doing this for 50 some odd years and starting out with uh, four or five people in a low vision lecture, it really is exciting to have a lot of you on. So this is about producing patient results and financial success. So uh, Ariel, Dr. Ariel has already gone through a lot of this, but I did graduate Pennsylvania College of Optometry in 1970. It wasn't Salus yet. Uh, Salus was created and the dean was Tom Lewis and he was in my class. So that was uh, very nice to see him create that. Um, I worked with Bob Gold, who's a low vision diplomat, who was a low vision diplomat back in Albany. Back then, I worked with William Feinblum. You might have heard of his name, Eleanor Fay, Bruce Rosenthal. Also, I've been very, very lucky in working with a lot of the founders of uh, low vision. And um, I was, of course, 12 years the upstate clinical director of the Lighthouse Low Vision Service in New York, and so practiced what I'll call nonprofit agency-based low vision. And then I moved to California in the early 90s, went into private practice and realized that obviously nonprofit agency-based low vision wasn't going to work in a private practice. And so I just uh, created a whole new model to work in a private practice and uh, founded the International Academy of Low Vision Specialists, started training doctors in the model that I uh, actually created. So it's about producing patient results, which we have to do in order for anything to be successful. We've got to take care of the patient. We have to be ethical. We have to be professional. We're working with people who are not normal type patients. These are people who have tremendous anxiety, they're very worried about their future, about their independence, about their life. And so they become easily taken advantage of. We have to be very, very careful to not do that and really be very professional and take care of them. But we also have to make a living. And that's the difference in private practice. So that's why I would say we're talking about producing financial results as well. So in other words, this is not the low vision you learned in school. The low vision you learned in school, they have to teach you how to take care of just about every type of low vision patient. And that's what I call nonprofit agency-based low vision. So when I was with the White House back in the 80s, it was a very nice way to practice because we had tremendous resources. So we could take care of any type of low vision from minimal, moderate, to severe, to even no vision whatsoever. It's the lighthouse for the blind. So we could take care of everybody. And when I say resources, we had orientation mobility specialists who would teach people how to get around with a cane if need be. We had occupational therapists who could work with patients. We had home instructor trainers that went into the house and teach people. <coughs> 
how to cook and clean. We had recreational specialists to teach visually impaired and blind people literally how to go bowling and how to play golf with limited vision. So we had a tremendous amount of resources. And we could bring the patient back for as many visits as necessary. We had thousands of dollars in loaner devices so we could loan patients hand magnifiers, stand magnifiers, all sorts of things. And of course, with anything like that loaning, Sometimes it comes back, sometimes it comes back in one piece, sometimes it doesn't come back. So these type of things are just not possible in a private practice. There's no way that I can hire all of these professionals in order to be able to do this. Plus the lighthouse had the ability to fundraise and they had a, an enormous amount of money backing them. So in an agency, that's how it is. In school, they have to teach you this. They have to teach you how to take care of any type of low vision patient. They have to teach you uh, how to deal with the, the, the allied professionals that work with low vision, the occupational therapists, the orientation mobility, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's a little scary and it kind of leaves optometrists graduating with the idea that it's difficult, it takes time, the patients are very hard to deal with. Uh, there's no money in low vision. So all of that is actually accurate if you're practicing in that mode. So at the lighthouse, I was given a salary. Every month I got my check. So if I needed to bring the patient back over and over again, I did. Okay, so that's this is not the same low vision. This is a lot easier. Okay, so moving right along. Why is my thing not working here? Here it is. Okay, got it. All right, so I just lost the entire thing. So we're going to start it again. There's always stuff that comes up, isn't there? That's a picture of me and my friends in Thailand. Okay, sorry, my computer is going a little crazy here, and I don't know why. Let's do it again. Okay, thank you. I only tested this out a few thousand times. You have to know that. And of course, then it happens. Okay, so we start with the definition of low vision, which uh, you should have in your handouts, which is fully corrected vision, which, which is insufficient to do what you want to do. So we need to talk about that. Because most doctors, most people who talk low vision think that it has to do with visual acuity or visual field. You know, 2060 is low vision. No, it's not. Low vision has to do with tasks, with function. So theoretically, we could say that just about anybody has low vision. I mean, a surgeon who's using a microscope to, to do surgery has low vision. A bird watcher is using a pair of binoculars. So, I've had patients who had 2025 20, and they're they considered low vision. They just needed help in seeing certain things. So there's two variables in here. One is the amount of vision, and the other is what you want to be able to do, the task. People have to have tasks that they want to be able to do that they can't. Otherwise, they're not a low vision patient. So low vision is about doing, not seeing. And so in the model that I created, it really starts with who I am. And who I am is win-win. The patient must win and the doctor must win. So what do I mean by who I am? Well, when I was at the lighthouse, who I was was the guy on the white horse. I would take care of anybody. My job was to get them functioning, get them less dependent, more independent, any which way I could. And I could spend as much time as I needed to, bring them back as many times as I needed to, and order anything that I thought would help them. When I came to California, I realized that being that wasn't going to work. So I needed to come up with really a different way of being in my private practice. And so 
I'm going to talk about who I am, and I'm going to say that where who I am lives is in what I'm listening for. So I'm going to start to talk to you about what to listen for when you are handling low vision patients. So I, I spent a lot of time on this, and I came up with two things. One is who I am is the patient must say they benefit. So that's the bottom line. I'm not going to see a patient that I don't think has the possibility of saying they benefit from my service. And the second thing is I must make money. So both things have to happen. So this is who I am in the matter of low vision. Both must occur. The patient must say they benefit. I have to make a living. So let's start with my statement, the patient must say they benefit. Well, we need the right patient. So this means that I cannot take in any patient. There are a lot of patients who need all of those services that I already mentioned. So I'm going to tell you that probably one out of every three calls that I get from people who want services actually gets an appointment uh, because they have to meet the two criteria. So we need a reasonable amount of vision and we need reasonable goals. And they need to be able to afford the kinds of devices. Low vision devices are not covered by Medicare. The low vision exam, depending upon how you want to build it, if you're going to do some medical, okay, you could build that. If you're going to call it rehabilitation, you can build that. If, you, if you're going to only do optics, refraction, and magnification devices, it's not covered. So the patient's going to come to me and I'm going to spend an hour with them because my low vision exam takes an hour. I never want to be in the position of saying, I'm sorry, I can't help you. And by the way, now you owe me money. So I want to know ahead of time that they have a reasonable amount of vision and reasonable goals. And we're going to go through this. So we need a phone conversation. That was one of the first things that I realized when I started getting a lot of phone calls. I went into private practice in the mid 90s here in California. So I'll give you a little story about that. Short story. Had a patient come in, 80 some odd years old woman, 2060 ish vision, wanted to continue driving, continue getting her driver's license renewed, and be able to see street signs and road signs. I fit her with bioptic telescope glasses. I made sure that she passed all the vision rules in California. She got her license. Uh, it, it got a story in the newspaper, and I got 150 phone calls in the next three days. So once I started talking to these people, I realized that I needed a phone conversation that's quick and tells me exactly what I need to know. So I figured out what I must listen for. I have to ask questions and have them answer, and I am listening for very specific things. So the phone conversation, and now I've, we've got... I've got about 50 or 55 doctors in, in my group that I've trained. And uh, I always train the doctor to answer the phones and take care of the phones themselves, but not many of them do. A lot of them have the staff. But in any event, one way or another, you need to have the right patient in the chair. So what do we need to know? We need to know approximately the amount of vision they have at this point now. We need to know the diagnosis. That helps to know if it's retinitis pigmentosa, it's different than a macular degeneration. So it's good to know what is causing the vision loss. And then the major thing, what do you want to be able to do that you can't do? What's on what I call the wish list? Can they get to the office? And then I'll talk about, uh, I'm asking them where they live. Like cognitive abilities, motivation, I want to know. And then I'm going to give information. So part one is I have to get information from the patient. Part two is I'm giving them information. So once I know approximately how much vision and I know approximately what they want to be able to do with it, then I can predict whether it will be successful or not. And then I explain what the exam will be like. It'll be an hour. We're going to figure out exactly how much vision you have. We have demonstrators of all types of low vision glasses and devices. We're going to put them on you. You're going to see what it looks like. You're going to feel what it looks like. And you're going to know they're going to work before we order anything. And these are the costs. So they know what the approximate costs are. Anywhere from 800 up to thousands. 
and then we make the appointment. So hopefully I can get this to work. Yeah, I can. This is a sample phone call. From Hi, I'm calling for Cy. Hello. Hello, it's Dr. Schuldiner from Low Vision. Yeah, doctor. Uh, I had called because I'm interested in taking a look at the uh, glasses you have with the uh, what are they, telescopic lenses. Are you having a problem? I have a very bad problem. Yes, I got uh, macular degeneration, wet. My right eye is of central vision is pretty well gone, but my left eye is uh, not not bad, not good, but it's not bad. Are you able to read newsprint at all? No, not now. How about with a magnifying glass? Uh, it's difficulty. Okay. Are you driving? Yes. Okay. When's the license expire? Uh, well, I just had it renewed a year ago. Okay, good. So you've got. So I'm going to pause it there for a minute. What did I hear? I heard that he can read with a magnifying glass. Of course, it's difficult to read with a magnifying glass one word at a time. is difficult, but it tells me that magnification helps. So I now know that with regard to reading, I can help him. Because if you can see a word or two with a magnifying glass, all I have to do is stick the magnifier into a lensometer, and I know what to put in the glasses, and I know I got them reading. Now, I might alter it a little bit higher, lower magnification, but I already know that I can help him with reading. He's already driving. If he's already driving, I already know that his peripheral vision is pretty good. And I know that he feels safe. And what I've learned over a very long time is that people are not stupid. When they feel unsafe, they stop driving. So I've learned that when a person is already driving, the odds are pretty darn good that I can keep them driving. I can't make an unsafe driver safe, but I can make a safe driver safer. So that's what I heard at the time. Five years. So what's on the wish list if, I, if these glasses well, can help? Well, what I, on the wish list is to be able to read the paper and read books. Okay. And, do that. and be able to read on the, I can see the television, but I can't, you know, read. Okay. And I, I, my central vision, uh, and of course, as I say, my right eye is, is pretty bad. I mean, it's, it's pretty well gone, but my left eye has been the one that saved me up till now. Now, based on what you're telling me, there are some predictions that I can make. So you want to notice that I control the conversation. I get right to what I want to hear, and now I'm going to predict so I can manage the expectations. That's one of the things in low vision is people come in with sometimes highly unreasonable expectations. I've got to manage them. Given that you can read with a, with a magnifying glass, even though it's difficult, mm -hmm. the odds are pretty good that I can get you special glasses to help you read a lot better. The telescope glasses will help you with seeing things at a distance, I see. like street signs, road signs, traffic lights, uh, the television set, people's facial expressions. So I'm pretty certain I can help you with both near vision and far vision, although it may take two different pairs of glasses yeah, sure in order to do that. that. So you know, I, I had heard that there, and I think there is a low vision aid place in, in the Cathedral City, they indicated they had magnifying glasses that you could adjust even. Well, they do not have anything that's prescription because yeah. they cannot do that. You, you just, you adjust them to whatever the best you can see, right? But that's different than making them specifically for you. Okay. And so you'd never be able... you're talking about making them specifically for me. For driving, that's what you absolutely need. I got you. Now, I need to work with you for about an hour. And we'll figure out how much vision you have and what you need. And by the end of an hour, I will show you. Okay. So you'll know exactly what they look like, exactly what they do. Okay. And hopefully, by the end of the exam, you'll have a smile on your face. Okay. I hope so, too. That would... Okay. So that is a typical uh, conversation that I have with patients. Uh, unreasonable goals. It might say, uh, you know, they want to drive. When's the last time you were behind the wheel? 10 years ago. The odds are not good. Uh, can you read newsprint? No. Can you read with a magnifying glass? No. Can you read the headlines on the newspaper? No. Okay, what are your goals? Well, if the goal is to see the TV better, I can probably do that. If their goal is to read small print or their small print Bible or whatever, the odds are I'm not going to be able to do that. So they need to know these things before they come in. And they need to know the possible costs of what it's going to be. 
I don't want somebody coming in and finding out that there is help available, but they can't afford it. And so when I deal with people who I can see are not really fit for coming into my office, fortunately, we've got two colleges of optometry here and we've got a Braille Institute, so I can refer them for services. Also, I live in Riverside County here. The Riverside County Department of Rehabilitation has counselors that can work with people. So we have resources I can send people to, and I do that all the time. If the patient's not right for my office, I will see what I can do to find them services somewhere and refer them. So once the phone call is complete and we make the appointment and they understand the cost, they understand what I'm gonna do and what I can't do, I will tell them what I cannot do or if I, what I think I can't do. A lot of people say, well, I'm concerned about walking and falling. You can't give magnification type devices that's gonna make it worse because then steps and curbs will look closer than they really are. So I will make sure that they understand what I can do and what I cannot do. So the next thing is the 12 step low vision exam. So again, in a private office, you can't spend two hours in a, in a low vision exam. An hour is about all you can, you can really take. So the original low vision education that I had was for nonprofit agency based as we already went through. So my evaluation is one hour. And step one is what I will call creating relationship. So you have to start to think about the person who's actually sitting in your chair. This is not your normal everyday I want to see better, or my glasses are not strong enough, my myope needs more minus, or contact lenses, or whatever. This is usually someone, a senior citizen, usually, but not always, but we'll talk about senior citizens who've had eye exams all their life, and they've been to doctors all their life, and they know what it's like to go in for an eye exam. Their expectation is, they're going to get new glasses and see better or new contacts and see better. Uh, their expectation is they're going to walk into an office, say hello to the receptionist. They're going to have to give them their insurance information. They're going to get a form to fill out. They got to fill out all this information. These are the things that people are used to. I want to completely eliminate that idea in their head because a low vision exam is completely different. They've been to a lot of eye doctors. If they have macular degeneration, which is 95% of my practice, they've been to optometry, they've been to ophthalmology, they've been to retina. They've been told at least three or four or five times, nothing more can be done. Nobody bothers to tell them nothing more can be done medically. They just say nothing more can be done. Well, it's not true because visually there's a lot that can be done. So how are they coming into the office? They're coming into the office with a history of Nothing can be done. Why am I here? I hope he can help. They're nervous. They're anxious. So I want to eliminate a lot of things that they're used to. I will give you some example here. So I have a video. Hi, Thelma. I'm Ann. Hi. You have an appointment with Dr. Shulvena. Yes. So Anne is my sister, and she worked for me for a little while. And I guess she got tired of her boss, so she quit. She doesn't work for me anymore. So I go and do this rather than she. But I eliminate any paperwork whatsoever. <laughs> Excuse me. They have a visual problem. Why do I want to give them a visual task? It's only going to make them feel worse. Or someone else has to fill out the forms for them, and they feel less independent. It's, it's just not a good thing. Take a little information to get you started. Okay. Okay, so we need. To, okay, so you have an appointment with Dr. Shuldina, and we're going to do a low vision evaluation. Yes. We're not going to do any dilation on your eyes, strictly, and we'll be with you in about a few minutes. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Here somewhere. There I am. There she is. So, yes, I go out into the waiting room every time. I introduce myself, I introduce myself to the family members. 
I try and keep it as light as I can. I try to make it a little bit fun, just so it's different. I figured since you were the only one without a pair of glasses on their face. <laughs> Must be me. Hello, dear. Hi. So you found us. Yeah. Very good job. If I had a, did, had not had a, a California resident, yes. I wouldn't have found you. Well, but you did. Yeah. So who's that? This is my fiancé, Ken. Hello, fiancé, Ken. And you do. And that's who's my that? daughter, Christy. Hello, Hi. daughter, Christy. Nice to meet you. Got the whole family here. Shuldiner. 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 You ready to do some work? Yeah, I want some results. Good. So you know we're filming. Yes. Don't worry about it. Okay. I'm going to talk to it like it's a doctor, so that uh, it's because it's all for training. Okay. So at that moment, when she gets up, there are a number of things I'm watching and listening for. I want to see what the family does. Are they going to get up? Are they going to ask to come in? Or are they going to sit there, just watching, just noting how interested they are? I'm also watching her mobility, so I do not ever have a staff person bring a patient into my into the room chair. So I, I have to see them walk and get around the obstacle. All right, come follow me, my dear. Okay. My uh, fiance's got diabetes, and we were reading that that you, you low, low vision people are, are also diabetic. Can be. And my daughter, Christy, is quite a comedian, and she said, Oh, good. That's the blind lady and the blind. <laughs> well, I'm happy to hear there's humor in the family. <laughs> it is. So come on in. We have a nice electric chair waiting for you. Uh oh, I don't want the electric chair. I didn't do anything. This we'll get rid of. Okay. Now, you'll notice I do have a chair there uh -huh. for either your daughter or your fiancé, or they can sit outside. So whatever wanna, you want. They want them to go ask, or see if they can ask somebody which one wants to come in. He sleeps. <laughs> so I always want someone in the room. Uh, people just don't remember what I say. Uh, the, the voice that's in their head is constantly talking. So whatever I say is not going to get all the way through. Uh, I just recommend that everybody who goes to a doctor should bring somebody along because more memory in the room is always good. Do I So do I want Ken or, or Christy or whoever it is in the room? Yes. But I didn't want to say that in front of the patient because it might cause an issue. If one of the two had gotten up and said, can I come in? I would have asked the patient, is it okay if she comes in? And I think she would have said absolutely. And sometimes I'll joke and say, listen, if you change your mind, let me know. I'm going to throw her out just to keep it light and fun. But I absolutely want them in there. Had she said, no, I don't want anyone in, I would have said, look, I'm going to talk a lot. And you're not going to remember. Are you sure you don't want anyone have anyone in there? And if they don't, they don't. There's nothing I can do about it. So no forms to fill out. Greet them in the waiting room. Introduce yourself to the family. Observation, watch mobility, and encourage somebody to be present. That's what I call creating relationship. The next step is called opening statements. It took me months to come up with the five sentences that I came up with. My goal was to put me in charge, let me get my job done, cut out any extraneous conversations because people who are in this position have a lot of history and a lot of things have gone on with them and they're worried and they really do want to talk. It's nice. When I was at the lighthouse, I let them talk, but not in a private practice. So here are the opening statements. So in this case, Stella, but Basically, I say, listen, I have a lot of questions for you because there's a lot of things I need to know. And there's a lot of things I don't need to know. So I might stop you from time to time because I only have one hour to send you home better than you walked in. That really gives me the permission to interrupt and to get the job done. And I keep it light. So here's a video on that. <laughs> All right, Thelma. I've got uh, lots of questions for you. Okay. I lots have... of things I'm going to want to know. Okay. Even more things that I don't want to know. 
so if you start that. rambling, okay, you'll I may have up. to interrupt. <laughs> okay. But my job's to send you home better than you walked in. Oh, I hope so. And now, if you notice her face when I said that, I'm going to send you home better than you walked in. That's what they're listening for. That's what they want to hear. So once I say it, I know that I can get my job done. I know that if they're going to ramble on and go in different stories, I can stop it and, and get to sending them home better than they walked in. So that's the second step in my 12th step. The third is the case history. So what do we need to know in the case history? Remember, they've been through all the medical tests. They've been through medicine. They come in here for function. So I'm really asking questions that are based on function. I don't need all the medical. So everything that relates to the task desired and focus on the future, not the past. Don't get hooked on their emotional. And you'll see in the video that I don't. I want short answers, yes or no. I don't ask what happened, why you're here, what's wrong, what can I do for you? Uh, that'll just lead to too many conversations. And I don't want to provoke emotions. So what's the eye condition called? Do you know the name of it? Macular degeneration. And the better eye is which one? My right eye. Last. Now, I don't know if you caught that. The way I asked the question, the better eye is which one? You would think asking which one is the better eye is the same exact thing as saying the better eye is which one, but it's not. And it took me a long time to figure that out. When you say which is the, they stop listening to the question. And they assume that I want to know about the bad eye. Because when you go to the dentist, he wants to know about the bad tooth, not the good ones. If you go and have a shoulder injury, they want to know which shoulder is the bad one. So people are used to the bad one. So when you say, which is the better eye, the answer you'll get is, well, you know, five years ago, I didn't notice I closed my right eye and the left eye, and, the, and they go on and on and on. The better eye is which one gives me the exact answer I want instantly. I'll show you again. Let's go back. Right last it's fading <laughs> last three months it's been going down yeah the cellular degeneration and the better eye is which one my right eye last it's fading <laughs> last three months it's been going down yeah at least three okay it, i do not ha i have not lost the central vision but i can't read as low small print as i was and things like okay. that okay how's your health doing it's pretty good i mean medicines yeah a lot of them. <laughs> what do you take for? What, what do you take medicine for? For uh, macular degen. I mean that I take eye caps. Okay. I take. Um, uh, I have a high hernia. And okay. I take Nexium. Okay. And I take an uh, arthri arthritis medicine called Oxaprozin. Okay. <laughs> I take a. a um, I don't know the name of the pill. It's new. I got it about a week ago, and it's uh, for I. I have um, what's the urgency thing called? Uh, uh, mm. Bladder right. control. Right. And I take a water pill for my blood pressure, and then I take because of the uh, bladder urgency, I take a pill that slows it down. Okay. And maybe that's about all. <laughs> now you live with Ken. Yes. Very good. He's your fiance. Yes, he is. When do you get married? We haven't set a date. We just got engaged. There's no rush. No. Okay, In I understand. My haste, there isn't. <laughs> I'm assuming you're retired. Yes, I wish I weren't, but I am. What did you do? My la well, I was a realtor, like my daughter, for uh, 20 some years. Okay. And my last job, I worked for 10 years for the state of Nebraska. As a negotiator, I bought right away for when road construction. Whoa, very nice. All right, what's on the wish list? So, um, probably went on longer than I wanted it to. I ask about family and if this family supports, so she has Ken. I ask about what occupation she had. That gives me some insights. 
She's obviously very intelligent, she's had some very good jobs. I would assume financially she's okay so that I don't have to worry too much about that. And um, I know she's motivated. So that's what I got out of that. Also, she has a lot of medications, which means I have to make sure that she's going to be able to see those medication bottles. She, she, we have to, she has, doesn't actually say it in her wish list next, but um, I do have to worry about that too. So a couple of things here. One is I'm not their psychological therapist. So we must remember psychological effects of vision loss, but I'm not their therapist. And I'm not their financial counselor either. My job is to get them to do what they want to do the best way possible and then present what it's going to cost them to do it. So I ask for the diagnosis, present status, stability, general health, medications. I do want to know that they're taking nutritional supplements if they're macular degeneration, because we do have evidence, strong evidence that they will mitigate the condition. I watch the mobility, home family support, and her occupations. So the next step is the wish list. So we need to talk about low vision devices because one low vision device doesn't do it all. So it's the concept of task specific. Low vision devices are task specific. They're designed to help with specific tasks. We have to ask, for specific tasks. So I break the wish list down into three sections. One is, and they all have to do with distance, how far. So distance is driving, sporting events, theater, seeing fast food menus, intermediate TV, playing bridge, computer, facial expressions, near, reading, writing, sewing, and handcrafts. So those are the kinds of things that I'm listening for. Um, I've had people tell me they want to play hand and foot. I have no idea what that is. They have to explain it to me. And, they, and, and I've, if necessary, I have them bring in materials with them so that I can actually see what they do. I have to do a task analysis. So here's this lady with her wish list. Whoops. Here's how we're going to get. All right, what's on the wish list? I wish I had my eyes. Back. So you can do what kinds of things? So you want to notice I didn't get hooked. I wish I had my eyes back. Of course they do. Everybody would. Um, you would think people would be thrilled with our low vision services. But, you know, if you think about an amputee having a leg amputated and having them have the greatest, best, most phenomenal prosthetic leg ever made, computer-driven, perfect. Are you happy? No. You'd rather have your leg back. The thing is, you can't get hooked by their emotionalism. You've got to stick to the job. All right, what's on the wish list? I wish I had my eyes back. So you can do what kinds of things? Oh, I'm an artist. I paint in oils and acrylic, and I read a lot, and... Uh, of course, I just never, when my kids were learning to drive, they had to leave my car alone at night. I okay. want a car in the driveway, so of course I want to drive. When's the last time you were behind the wheel? I still, oh, probably just three or four weeks ago for a short time. So I'm listening for, does she still consider herself a safe driver or an unsafe driver? And if she's not driving, why? And when was she behind the wheel last? That's what I'm listening for. Okay. I can drive a lot, but I still want to be able to go by myself. So you you haven't driven in about a month? Yeah, about a month. Why? Well, we came back from Kenosha, Wisconsin with my car on a trailer, and um, he just goes everywhere I go, so he drives. All right, so you haven't driven in a month, not because your vision changed. No, but it is a little bit okay. scary. I now don't drive um, evenings because of my vision. What do you have trouble seeing when you're driving? I can see street signs. I'm just afraid. So that question, what do you have trouble seeing when you're driving? <clears throat> Excuse me. 
I'm listening for street signs, road signs, traffic lights, specific things in the distance. If they're saying I have trouble seeing cars, I have trouble seeing a kid crossing the street, I have trouble staying in my lane, I'm not going to be able to help them with that kind of stuff. I'm going to help them with specific distance, central vision tasks, street sign, traffic light, things like that. Aid then I won't, especially out here in Las Vegas. Okay. The traffic's so fast and everything, I'm All scared right. that I will miss somebody in a rear view mirror or something and pull out and change lanes in front of them. When does your license expire? I just got it last May, I think. So, <laughs> excuse me, sorry. When does my license expire? When does your license expire? I need to know whether I have to deal with their state and the DMV rules and regulations regarding level of vision and whether or not bioptics are permissible. So I need to know when the license expires. In this case, I don't have to worry about her license expiring, so I'm not. Okay, April. so we have some time on it. Yeah, a, I mean, four year, years. Four years, okay. It, it's a, it's a um, Wisconsin license. How are you doing with television? Um, we have a very big screen. So How big? 56. Okay. How big? Because if I'm going to help her with a pair of telescope glasses to see the TV, telescope glasses always reduce field of view. So I need to know how big that TV is so I know how much it's going to crop when they look through the telescope. Uh, I want to avoid the complaint after the fact. I want her to know ahead of it so we can decide whether or not she should have them or not have them. Okay, so you're, having, so you're okay with that? Yeah, if I stare directly, this is my interpretation of my eyesight. This is a close lost yeah. gray, and this one's better, and I almost feel like a cross-eyed person seeing two different things. Let's go back to the artistry. Uh -huh. the, uh, you're an artist, you work with oils. Oils and acrylics. When you do that, you have a canvas in front of you. So now we're looking at the task analysis. She's an artist. I really need to know more about that so I know what distances she needs to see in order to be able to do it, what she wants to do, and how fine is it so I know how much magnification I have to give her. Mm -hmm. Are you kind of just like making up what you want to go there, or are you looking at something and trying to depict it? I look at something and I look at several different things. I combine different things, maybe a, a woman in the street and different trees from a different picture and things All right, like so that. So I've got to have you see different distances in order to right. be able to do that. Okay. Right. okay. Most of it is a landscape. Okay. You wear your sunglasses when you go out? Always. Good. Oh, I can. I did All right, so we have her wish list. We know that she needs to see at a long distance in order to see landscape. She needs to see an intermediate distance. She needs to see perhaps a near distance, maybe not. What do most people want who come in? Well, driving is number one, especially in California where mass transit literally doesn't exist. Reading, computer. Now, I had one man tell me reading is the most important thing for him. And I noticed that his occupation was farmer. I actually stopped and said, I understand you want to read, but I don't know. I always thought that farmers didn't have a lot of time to read. <clears throat> Excuse me. Gosh. And his answer was, well, if you can get me reading, then I'm going to be able to do this, 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 this. And he gave me five things that had nothing to do with reading, really. It had to do with seeing gauges at a certain distance in his engine. So you got to really get specific. You want to read. What do you want to read? What do you like to read? Do you read with an iPad? Do you read with a Kindle? Do you read magazines, books? Bring the materials in that you want to be able to read that you can't. And then I can work with it. Uh, computer, people want to see the computer better. Television is a big one. Card playing. Uh, out here in California, a lot of people play bridge. That is a very big thing. Um, I had a couple come in a number of years ago. The woman's the patient. The husband's sitting there. They're both in their late 80s. I asked her what's on her wish list, and he started crying. 
I said, okay, and stopped. I said, okay, tell me, sir, what's going on? He said, well, our entire enjoyment at our retirement facility centers around playing bridge. She can't see the cards anymore. We can't play bridge anymore. We lost all our friends. We don't know what we're going to do. And so for them, that was a very big thing. And yes, I did get her playing again. People didn't see prices, labels, menus, seeing faces, facial expressions. Some people want to see music to play their instrument. And hand grabs. All right, so that's uh, fourth step. Fifth step is distance, acuity, and refractive status. So I do need to know if the glasses they're coming in with are relatively correct. And way back when I first started doing low vision, they weren't. Because back then, people were not ophthalmologists, optometrists, well, ophthalmologists, for one thing, certainly couldn't refract very well. And so we had to really do a trial frame refraction to, to get them seen better. And a lot of times they weren't even low vision. These days, it's not the case. With auto refractors, with optometrists being in ophthalmological offices, 95% of the time, even more than that, 99% of the time, the prescription they're wearing is about as good as it's going to be. So I'm very good with my retinoscope. And I just hold up my neutralizing lens with their glasses on. And almost always, it's going to be somewhere near planar. Now, you've got to relate what you see with your retinoscope to the acuity. So if the acuity is fairly good, meaning 2040, 2050, and you see a little bit of plus or a little bit of minus, you've got to check it out and see if it's going to do anything. If they're 2200, prescription can be off a half adapter, and they're really not going to notice the difference. So you're not going to prescribe it. So in doing visual acuity, in testing visual acuity, there's a lot of different charts available. So which chart is better, one or two or three? I happen to like this standard, what's called the Feinblum chart, originally designed by Bill Feinblum, William Feinblum, because it has numbers. And number two, I can hold it. So I can hold it in front of the person and most of the time I'll start at five feet. So I know whatever number I get, this is a 700 size at 20 feet. Well, at five feet, it's, four, it's five, five times bigger. No, it's four times bigger at five feet, I'm sorry. Uh, will I use a Snellen chart or a projected chart? Yes, I will. If I think the vision is better than 20 over 100 or 2100 or better, I'm gonna use a projected chart. If it's less than that, I want to use the fine bloom chart where I can actually go in and out, move it. Now, you notice on the Snellen chart, you got a 200 and a 100. That's a real problem in low vision because I have a ton of patients who are in between 2150, 2160, 2180. Uh, we'll get to this later, but I'll mention it now. In the state of California, what's the vision requirements for driving? Believe it or not, one eye has to be better than 20 over 200. Now, I know it may shock some people. How could that be? But vision driving is more of a peripheral vision task than a central vision task. And I'm standing and I'm a lot bigger than a 20 over 200 letter. So if I can get them to 20 over 160, they pass DMV's requirements. I'm not giving them a license. I'm not telling them they can drive. I don't know if they can drive. I don't know if they're a safe driver. All I'm doing is giving the patient the ability to tell DMV, test me, and see if I'm a safe driver. So, and then there are other type charts available as well. So I start at any distance and at any size that I know they will see. I always start with the better eye. I want to have this be a positive experience for the patient. They've had too many times where they've sat in a chair, the big E is up there, and they look at it and they say, well, I can't see it. Or I can see the E, but that's all I can see. I want to start with a large number and go down, 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 and let them see that there's actual vision to work with. 
And I also start to teach eccentric viewing techniques. So even on the Pura, if, um, if I cover the good eye after I've tested it, and they say, oh, I have no vision in that eye. If they're macular degeneration, I know there's vision in that eye. So I can stand in front of them at five feet with the fine bloom chart. I can say, okay, just keep looking at my face and I can move the chart around left, right, up, down, and there'll be vision there. And then I'll start flipping the chart. And that amazes them that they actually do have a functional eye. And it also amazes the person who's sitting on the side, their wife, their husband, or their daughter, whatever. It amazes them. And it also shows them that I know a lot more about how to test vision than anybody else. So uh, that's why I start teaching synchronous viewing techniques. And I want to squeeze out every bit of acuity as I possibly can. Autorefractors are not usually useful with low vision. You can try it. Uh, I've never used, I haven't used a foropter in 25 years because you have to be out in space and you have to give the patient the ability to move their head and move their eyes and look around. And you have to watch what they're doing. And if a lot of patients of mine move, they're moving their head all over the place to see. And I start teaching them to keep the head still and move the eyes. And once they can start doing that, to get them reading will be a lot easier. So teach. Um, then there's this thing called the just noticeable difference, which really doesn't make too much of a difference. But theoretically, if someone's 20 over 200, they're not going to notice anything more than a plus or a minus anything less than a plus or a minus one in changing their glasses prescription. If you see a difference, make sure it's demonstrated in the real world to see if it makes a difference. I've had, I've scoped patients minus three, minus four. They come in not wearing their, any glasses. They say they have no glasses. I scope them at minus three, minus four. I put it on them. They see no difference. It's, it's, Weird, but that happens. Next step in the 12 step is the near acuity. There's a lot of different near charts. So the Snellen near charts are all each calibrated for a different distance. So you have to look at the card. Jaeger has no calibration whatsoever. In low vision, we use the M notation. It's easier for a patient to read single letters and numbers than it is to read words, than it is to read sentences, than it is to read paragraphs. Personally, I use this number chart just to give myself a kind of a quick idea of how far down they can go. And I let the patient hold it wherever they want to hold it. So I get a sense of whether they like to hold it close, whether they've tried holding it close, how much difficulty am I going to have with them to get them holding it closer when I start using plus lenses to get them reading by plus lenses? The thing is, with what I'm doing, you have to be a little careful because I've had some patients go way down to like 1M, which is newsprint size in numbers. And then I start to think, well, that's going to be easy. I'm going to get them reading easy. That's not always the case. Because if they have geographic atrophy, if they have one small little island of very good vision, they're going to do very well on that number card. But the minute I give them sentences or paragraphs, they can't do it. And so when I start working with them with magnification and I give them things to read, if I notice that they're having difficulty, even though they did well on the number, I immediately go back and start with very large and I go smaller and smaller to see if maybe there's another area with lesser acuity, but a wider area for them to be able to read. And then comes what I call stop and talk number one. So you might have noticed, let's go back a second here, that the first six of these steps are all gathering information. I'm getting information. So I want to stop and talk, and I want to give them a little relief, a little relaxation. I want to kind of tell them what I know so far. 
I want to educate them now, depending upon the level of education of the patient, which goes back to what their occupational status was very often. I get a sense of how deeply I want to go into the technicalities of what I'm going to do. I do want to manage their expectations. I do want to answer their questions. I do want to give them a break. I've noticed sometimes that, well, people have to use the restroom. And I don't know how I know it, but somehow I just get a signal that if they took a break, things would be a lot better for them. So that's what I do. So here's a video on stop and talk. Number one. So here's what I know so far. Okay. Obviously, the right eye is better than the left eye. Mm -hmm. The vision on the right eye on this eye chart right here is about 20 over 50. You're getting one or two letters on the 2040 line. That's what they called me last week when I went to the ophthalmologist. So you're somewhere in the 2050 to 2040 area. Mm -hmm. And with macular, it will vary. It does, day to day and yes, week it to will. week. So if we say your vision is 2040, for example, tell me what that means. One of them probably need, means nearer and one far. No? Good, good idea, but no, nope, not it. I don't know. I know they, all my life I've heard 2020. It means at a distance of 20 feet, Yeah. you're seeing the letter that we call the 40 line. Oh, okay. That's the size. Oh, okay. And the 20 line's what I should be seeing. And the 20 line is half the size of the 40 line. Oh. So you're seeing letters on the eye chart that are twice the size of what you normally see. Actually, slightly larger than that, maybe two and a half times the size, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. So what does that mean in real life? It means when you're driving, you've got to get twice as close to signs, traffic lights, people, to see them the way you used to. That's just what it means. I said that to them on the way here. I read Center Street, and I said, I have to be a lot closer to read that. Today. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So that's what it means in, in the world. Mm -hmm. What does it mean in the field of eye care? It's All right, so I stop here for a minute because... You can see I'm giving her a little more information technically than I would someone else. If I start seeing their eyes glaze over, it will um, alter what I'm saying. The thing about her level of vision, 2050, maybe, uh, maybe even 2040-ish, is very interesting because those people are the toughest low vision patients. The 2200s are easy. The 2150s are easy. The 2040s are not. And so I go into what I have called, what I decided to call the 2040 club. And here's this explanation I give. You'll notice that I'm going to be talking more to the daughter than I am to the patient because I have to set up and manage the expectations of the daughter. I have to make sure that the daughter understands that no matter what I do, and you'll see, the complaints are not going to stop no matter what I do. It's very interesting what it means in the field of eye care because according to the World Health Organization, 2040 is a very minimal vision loss. Mm. So to eye doctors, 2040 is not a big loss. Mm -hmm. To patients, however, it's not a very minimal vision loss, is it? No, it's no. not. In fact, 2040, 2050 vision is incredibly frustrating. I've seen an awful lot of patients with that level of vision, and they're virtually all the same. They are very, very big complainers. <laughs> they are just frustrated as can be, mm -hmm. annoyed, complain that I can't do this, I can't do that, and then when you watch them, they obviously can. Because what they mean is, I can't do it like I used to, but they'd leave the like I used to out. Mm -hmm. So you hear, I can't do it. Mm -hmm. I give her a newspaper, I know she can read it. Nah, I don't know about a newspaper, something a little bit bigger. Yeah, if I put some good light on it, you'll read it, but you'll read it slowly and difficultly, and you'll complain, I can't do it. Mm -hmm. So, at, plus you've got the difference of the two eyes, which affects the depth perception. So it leaves people very, very annoyed. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, the people who have lousy vision in both eyes are much more relaxed. Hmm. 
they don't complain nearly as much. Is there like something teasing them? Or, you, know, like I, you know, I don't know the answer. I don't know why, same. but I know that that's the case. Well, that's like I said, it feels like what I imagine a cross-eyed person look like. Well, I'm seeing some of there, and then I'm seeing very some annoying. There, I don't know what, how to combine the two. Well, here's the bright side. If the vision gets worse, you're going to feel better. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, we don't want that, I said do I'd we? I'd rather lose a hand or a foot or I know, than I my understand. Eyes. All right, so the good news and the bad news. The good news is, yes, I can help. Okay. That's I have the question. good news. Okay, I have questions. Okay. We talked just briefly, and I, I've seen ads about these telescope things. Yes. And she was, she's going to ask a question now, but she's not asking the question she wants the answer to. She's asking a question, but it's not the question she's really asking. So listen for what she's really doing. I said doing. I'd rather lose a hand or a foot. Or I know, than I understand. Eyes. All right, so the good news and the bad news. The good news is, yes, I can help. Okay. That's the questions. good news. Okay, I have questions. Okay. We talked just briefly, and I've seen ads about these telescope things. Yes. And we talked about the price and mm -hmm. one for driving and one for reading. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how often you probably have to have those redone. Very rarely. What she's really asking is, should I spend the money? That's what she's asking. So my job is to speak to that listening. What is she listening for? Um, what you listen for in a low vision room is not the same as what you listen for when you're in an exam room with a normal patient. And so I pay very close attention to what she is listening for. What does she need to hear from me? And so you'll hear my answer. I've seen ads about these telescope things. Yes. And we talked about the price and mm -hmm. one for driving and one for reading. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how often you probably have to have those redone. Very rarely. Oh, really? It's amazing. Hmm. Which is why I tell people any changes over the next year won't cost you anything. Okay. <laughs> so that's my policy. Any changes over the next year won't cost you anything. But <clears throat> it doesn't happen that often. And it makes people feel a lot more secure in spending the money that it's gonna take for her to have the help that she needs. And I wanna make sure she has the help she needs. So it's just easier for me to have that policy and I'll change it. I'll see her as many times as possible as she needs during the year without it costing another nickel. This doesn't happen often. And was there a time going to come when I can't use, then those would do me no good. Well, you'd have to get a new condition because with macular, only the central goes. So you're always right. going to have peripheral and it always oh, magnifies. I, so, I told people I, can see, I can't see his face, but I can see the ceiling fan going and things yeah, like so that. Yeah, the, so the odds of, uh, if, with macular, there's no chance of you losing everything. You'd have to come up with something Thank else. Thank God you made me happier right there. Well, I know <laughs> doctors have told you that. They They've have told to me have that. That yeah, I'll just, never go just, completely blind. Well, you just don't want to believe that. Yeah. Okay. If I can't paint and I can't drive, I've gone blind. <sighs> well, let's Although, work on those. Although, I think maybe I could change to abstract. <laughs> <laughs> so, that is my stop and talk, typically. If I have an engineer sitting in the chair, I'm going to go into more detail. If I have a person who I can tell just really doesn't care that much about all this, just the, the technicalities of what I'm going to do, I'll do less. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this completes the first half of the low vision evaluation. So I now have all the information I need to start helping the patient. So I have a particular philosophy of prescribing for the patient. Who am I? The patient must say they benefit. The doctor must make a living. And that is my philosophy. And what's the best way in terms of making money? So where I got that philosophy from and why I call the training that I do with doctors, the Richard Sheldina, William Pinebloom, is because when I spent time with him, he sat me down and said, listen, don't be afraid to make money. The more money you make in low vision, the better you will do it. And he's right. 
I am phenomenally good at what I do, and so are the doctors that I train. We make sure that we get the job done, and we make a living. So my philosophy, number one, you must provide professional, ethical, and excellent service. If you don't, you develop a poor reputation, and no one will, no one will come to see you. I did train a doctor once who wasn't ethical. It's a shame, but he would go to people's houses. He would do the evaluation. He would take their money and never come back and never come back with the glasses. So obviously, I had to make sure that he had no association with me whatsoever and he stopped doing low vision. We made sure of that. You just can't have that kind of reputation. Two, you must be financially viable. You must make money. If you don't, you'll go out of business. You can't help anyone. This is not a hobby, unfortunately or fortunately. It's a job. and We have to do the job. And we have to make a living. Number three, <clears throat> you're not the patient's financial manager or their financial consultant. You're their low vision optometrist. Your job is to get them to do what they want to do. If they want to spend the money, fine. If they don't want to spend the money, fine. I don't pressure anybody. I don't talk them into anything. They want it, they want it, they don't want it, they don't want it. Most of the time, if they don't want it, it's because they just didn't see enough benefit. Such is life, that's fine. My number four philosophy, which is not in here, so I'll call it 3A, is there isn't any one patient or any one sale or one device that I have to sell. It's fine with me if they don't get it. In fact, when people say, can I think about it? <clears throat> My answer is, you can think about it, but you shouldn't. And it's funny because they'll be like shocked. Like, Why shouldn't I? Because you're seeing what it does right now. Right now, you have them on. I have demonstrators on you. This is how you're going to see. Either you like it or you don't. Why go home and think about it? If it's not good enough, don't get it. Don't go home and waste your time and your energy thinking about it. Just don't get it. I don't have a problem with it. Also, my philosophy is the best devices for the patient are prescription, built for them, custom made, not over the counter. I also believe that people prefer glasses, to low vision devices in the form of glasses, if at all possible. And number six, lastly, no surprises. Before the patient comes in, they must know possible costs, how long the process is, what the device is going to look like, what it's going to feel like on them, that there's possible vision changes. And if there's anything I can do to make it better, if the vision changes, I will without it costing. They need to know the refund policy. There's a custom made for them. So there's not going to be a refund, but absolutely they're going to have the backup that they need. Look, the truth of the matter is people don't want a refund. When I order things from Amazon, I don't want a refund. I want it to work. If it doesn't work, yes, then I want a refund. But really, I don't want the refund. I'd rather have somebody come here and show me how to make it work because I bought it in the first place for a reason. People don't want the refund. They want it to work. So one through seven, gets me the information I need. Eight, nine, and 10 has to do with helping them with the various tasks that they have. I like to start with the near tasks first, then their intermediate tasks, then their distance tasks. But you really can do it in any order that you find necessary. I used to really stick to near first no matter what until I had a patient that kept telling me, I want to drive. I want to be able to see to drive. And I kept saying, okay, well, let's get you reading first and then we'll work on driving. And he said, but doc, I want to drive. And finally, my little voice said to me, you're being an idiot. He wants to drive, get him driving. So I kind of learned from my own mistakes. So you have to do a task analysis. Working distance. How far is the distance that they can work at? If it's a hand task, like, I don't know, peeling potatoes, they can't do it an inch from their face. So at what working distance? If they're going to play music, 
The music has to be at a particular distance. They can't keep it up very close. What field of view they need. Let's use music as an example again. How wide a field do they need to be able to actually follow along and play their piano or whatever it is? Well, how much lighting do they need? How much lighting is available? I've had patients where they can't see the cards on the table when playing bridge. They have a little difficulty in their hand. And when I put the light on, wow, they can see it. I said, well, you just need light. They say to me, but there is none. Where we play, the light is overhead. The light is the light. And I cannot have more light. Well, you got to figure out a way to solve that one. Hand-eye coordination. Can, if, if they're reading and you're giving them high magnification and they're tremoring, well, what are you going to do about that? Depth of focus. Sometimes people need more depth of focus. And sometimes it's hands-free. They have to have their hands free. So these are the things that you have to analyze in the task. So remember, low vision is about doing, not about seeing. The most common tasks, reading, driving, TV, and faces. How do we help people in low vision? We're dealing most of the time with central vision loss. And so that's what I'm going to talk about. Do we have things for people who have peripheral vision loss? Yes, but it's less common, more difficult, and you really better know what you're doing when you're working with those kind of patients. You're actually better off referring them to somebody who's done a lot of low vision and understands the, the difficulty in getting a patient to get used to and understanding what those devices do. So we'll stick with magnification is how we usually help because most of our patients are central vision loss. And we know that low vision devices are task specific and they're designed pretty much for the task that you're doing. Now, often I try and get them to be able to do two or three tasks with one pair of glasses if I can. So, starting with, let's say, reading, near. Well, let's start with high plus lenses. The more plus you add, the closer they're going to have to bring the material. The closer they bring the material, the bigger it looks. So in truth, the plus lens is not magnifying. It's really that they're bringing it closer, the plus lens is putting it in focus. So there's different types and different ways. Let's go through them. Let's talk first a little bit about the optics of plus lenses. I'm not gonna go deeply into optics. But in the metric system, if you put a one over the dioptric power, you get the distance in the metric system. So a plus lens, a plus eight lens, focuses at an eighth of a meter or 12 and a half centimeters. So if you're a thinker in the metric system and you want to know where the lens you're putting in front of them focuses, put a one over. If you're dealing in the imperial system, you put a 40 over it. Why? Why 40? Because 40 inches is approximately one meter. Yes, it's smidge less, but it's close enough. So just put a 40 over the dioptic power. So if you're dealing with an eight diopter lens, 40 over eight, five inches. So that's the optics of plus lenses. So you at least know where the person should be holding it. If they say it's clearest at a different distance than what you calculate, then we missed a refractive error. And I had that happen with me. I had that happen with a patient where at, theoretically they were, should be holding it at four inches to see, and they were holding it at like eight or nine inches. And I kept saying, are you sure? And he said, sure. And I said, okay, well, there must be a lot of plus that I'd missed. And sure enough, it was. Sure enough, I tried scoping them. I really had no ability to get a reflex. reflex, <laughs> reflex. And so, I just put on a trial frame and I stuck a plus four, plus five, plus six, and boy, she, she lit up. <clears throat> Next in optics, <clears throat> in low vision, the standard of magnification is every four diopters is one X. So plus eight is two X. 
and you can see one meter is approximately 40 inches. So we went through that already. The patient has to hold the material at the correct distance. <clears throat> is it easy to get them to hold it close? Well, in some cases, they have no choice. And in other cases, they do have a choice and you can give them a choice. So if you're thinking, well, I can't get my people to hold it that close, you have to watch the patient's body language when you're working with them. I like to always start with plus lenses first to see what gets them reading. How much magnification do I need? How much plus lenses do I need to get them reading? So as they're holding it closer, if they say, do I have to hold it this close? I'll just tell them, well, I'm just testing you to see what I need. Don't, don't worry about it. Um, some people, no matter how much you push, they, they are just not gonna bring it closer. It's just, that's just the way it is, it's not gonna happen. <clears throat> Boy, my throat is going crazy today. And you can catch unrefractive errors. I mentioned that. Good news, and I'm being facetious about this. Every state board in the United States of America is now allowing optometrists to prescribe an ad higher than three. I don't know what it is about optometry. It's what's going on in the schools and with people coming out. But for some reason, that's it. Three ad. No more than that ever. Why not? Can you go with an eight ad? Yes. Can you go with a 16 ad plus 16? Yes, you can. You can go as high as you need to if that patient is willing to hold it close enough in order to read. So there are cement executive bifocals where you can put any plus lens down here. <coughs> Sorry, let me just clean my throat. <clears throat> Getting older is not fun. The body just does what it wants to do. Okay. You can have what we call a microscope lens. So what's a microscope lens? A microscope lens is just any lens, any plus lens that that's eight or higher. We call it a microscope. It's a plus lens. So we have prismatics. And let's go through them a little bit more in detail. So is the patient monocular or binocular? Are both eyes about the same, 2050, 2060, 2070, or is one 2070 and the other eye is 2400? If the patient acuities are almost equal and you can use up to about 10 diopters, you could use prism for binocularity. So there are ready-made prismatic half eyes, plus four with base in, plus five with more base in, plus 10. This is about a plus eight with about 12 prism diopters base in each eye. They come ready-made, it's one piece. <clears throat> some manufacturers make them in xyle frames, some in metal frames. I would suggest everyone who has a private practice have this series in their office. If somebody's down to 2030, 2040, and that no matter what, that's, that's the best acuity if you wanna read, stick a pair of these on them, and you will have made a very, very happy person right away, immediately. high ed bifocals. So what the lab here does is they cut out a circle or an oval, and they put a doublet lens. When you get into higher plus lenses, you really need to eliminate the aberrations. And so we get into what's called doublet lenses. There's a plus lens here and a plus lens here. Same thing here. Uh, this one is about four inches away. So this is probably, probably this is close to a 3X 12 diopters. Uh, this lady's wearing 14X. So 14 times four, 56 diopters. And she was thrilled to remember her. She flew in from Peru. She wanted to read in the worst way with a pair of glasses. I got her reading that. She held it up right up to her face and the tears started flowing. She was thrilled. So there's no limit. I can get lenses up to 80 diopters. Now, they can't hold it that close. They don't want to hold it that close. There's a task that they have to have more distance. Now you have to get into a telescope. 
And there are different types of telescopes. There's Keplerian telescopes and Galilean telescopes. And we don't have to get that technical tonight. This is a 1.7 times. This is a 2.2 times telescope that's focused for near. In this particular case, this lady is focused 13 inches away. So she's getting about a little over two times magnification considering the distance because she's bringing it into 13 inches. So it's making newsprint look twice as big. And on the 2.2, it's probably going up to close to three times bigger. Now the field of view is smaller, but at least they can hold it further away. <clears throat> so let's get into TV faces, full diameter telescopes. So we use Galilean most of the time. Galilean telescope is a plus lens and a minus lens with a separation in between. There has to be a separation in between. And they're afocal. That means virgin's light going in parallel from a distance comes out parallel. So there's actually no vergence change in the telescope. So they're good for distance. This is Jane Russell. I don't know if you know, uh, remember the movies that she was in with Marilyn Monroe way back when uh, she came to visit me and uh, she wanted to be able to read and she wanted to watch TV. So I was able with one pair of glasses to get her to read and watch TV. How did I do that? Well, the 1.7 full diameter telescope, which is here, it's also in the middle of one, and I'll show you this bifocal cap and talk to you about that in a minute. But, uh, so she was able to read, to see the TV much, much better. 1.70% better. So, and, and believe it or not, lower magnification works better for patients than higher magnification. So there are some, low vision specialists that will tell you, here's the visual acuity, and therefore this is the amount of magnification you must have in the telescope. I don't buy it. I don't buy that visual acuity. There are some doctors that say, we wanna get the patient to 2040. So if they're 20 over 160, they have to have a four times telescope. Nope. I don't buy it. Even if they're 20 over 160, I'll give them maybe two times telescope. So bring them to 2080. Are they perfect? Of course not. Can they see the street sign twice as quickly as they did before? Absolutely. Are they happy? Yes. Four times telescope, much smaller field of view, a lot more movement. So if you think a 1.7 is not that much, believe it or not, this has made me very nicely financially well off. And people are thrilled with it, both. The patient says they benefit and the doctor makes a living. So that was her. So what we did was we gave her a plus lens cap that went over one eye, because one eye was better than the other, and then she could read with it. This middle one is very interesting. This is a uh, Texas Hold'em poker table. And um, this is patient Sandra, I won't give her last name. I was sitting next to her at the poker table and it was her turn to bet. She was to my left and she was taking her time. And one of the other participants said, hey lady, you betting or not? And her answer was, I have macular degeneration, give me a minute. So when the hand that, it was over, I looked at her and I said, guess what? I'm a low vision doctor, I can help you with that. And she did come in to see me and I fit her with what? The 1.7, well, her, her acuity was about 2080 or something like that. I fit her with the, with the 1.7 telescopes so that she could see TV, but then I fit her with a bifocal cap that she could put on when she was playing poker. And so, once I had everything set, uh, we actually called the casino and they had to call the California Gaming Commission to, to, to prove that I could sit her at an actual table and have a dealer there. 
Now, if you know Texas Hold'em, every seat has a little bit different distance to the cards on the table. And I had her move around to make sure that the glasses actually worked, and they did. So that worked out very, very nicely. So task analysis and doing the task. So we've handled near with plus lenses and with telemicroscope, telescope that's focused for near. Uh, we've talked about intermediate distances, which is playing cards, playing bridge, playing poker, watching TV, seeing people's faces. Those are all intermediate distances. And those one seven full diameter telescopes are just phenomenal for that. And when you can put caps on them, plus caps on them to change the focal distance from out there to any near distance, um, it gives people a bit of bang, better bang for their buck. When it comes to far distances, you really, the only thing is a far telescope, a distance telescope. And so there's two ways to make the telescope, the full diameter, which you already saw, which is really a sitting telescope. They have to be sitting when they're using that telescope. You can't walk around with magnification of 1.7. Everything looks 70% closer. And if you try and go up and down steps or a curb, you're going to really hurt yourself. So they have to be sitting for that. So driving. Driving with bioptic telescopes. Bioptic means bi, means two, means there's a carrier lens with the patient's prescription in the bottom and a telescope on top with the patient's prescription in the telescope. That's why when you heard on the phone call conversation earlier with Sai, and he said, well, I can go to this place, which he meant was the Braille Institute. They don't have a doctor. Yes, they can give him telescope glasses that actually have a little focusing knob, but it's not a bioptic. It's not built for him. It doesn't have his prescription in it. And no, that's, he can't drive with that. Yeah, he could get it to watch TV. The optics is not great. Um, the 1.7s that I'm custom making that have a prescription in it. So the ones you saw before, where I go back, we put her regular prescription in the telescope. Same thing in, in Sandra's. So... I don't know if you recognize this man. He gave me permission to actually say his name. This is Carol Shelby, the race car driver, and the one who produced the Shelby automobile came to me with macular degeneration, wanted to continue driving. He was driving a Ford Focus at the time, and uh, I fit him with bioptics. He sees past, but it was very wonderful working with him. So this lady, same thing. On the bottom, you've got her prescription on the top. You've got her telescopes. These happen to be 2.2 times, all three of them. It's the one I use the most, no matter what the acuity. The acuity is always going to be better than 20 of the 200. So even if it's 2180, I'm still getting them to see things 2.2 times faster. And it's a very nice wide field of view. How does it work? I should have had mine here. I would have, told, I would have put them on for you. But basically, it's just bringing the chin down. It's very simple. The telescope sits above eye level. You notice on the middle case here that the scopes are above her eye level. Will she say, I see them? Yes. But don't worry about that. Sooner or later, you won't even notice that they're there. So all they have to do is bring their chin down. And they see through it. It's almost the same as looking in your rear, view, your rear view mirror. You move your head to look through the rear view mirror. What's the big deal? Or your side view mirror. So that's how a bioptic telescope works. California has no rules with regard to getting used to them before they can drive with them. They are legal. You cannot use them to pass the vision test. So at DMV in California, the vision test is 2040 letters. But there's a vision report form. And again, if one eye is better than 20 over, over 200, they are at least eligible to take a drive test. It doesn't give them a license. It just gives them the ability to show DMV whether or not they're a safe driver. Well, what if they, what if they feel safe, but the daughter doesn't feel safe? And I've had that. I've had patients sit down and say, I want to keep driving, and I've seen the daughter on the side there or the wife on the side, they're shaking her head, no, 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 no. Well, first of all, 
the patient is my patient. If he's better than 20 over 200 in one eye, I'm going to fill out a vision report for him to give him the ability to show DMV whether he's safe or not. But I'm going to have a conversation with the patient. Your daughter, your wife does not feel you're safe. Here's what we're going to do to make everybody happy. Are you willing to make everybody happy? The patient almost always says, yes, I want to make everybody happy. Good. I'm going to refer you to a driving rehabilitation person. In fact, I actually have one here in my own town, which is very good. And there's an organization that you can look up and find driving rehab people. They can have dual control cars and they're going to work with you and see how safe you are. You may be safe under certain conditions, maybe local only, maybe under 40 miles an hour or whatever. Or maybe they'll say, listen, you're unsafe. Don't be on the road. But we're going to go to a third party and let them decide. And that's always satisfies everybody. And I, you know, they go and give them the name and the phone number and say, here. The bioptic is for reading signs, seeing traffic lights, seeing emergencies up ahead. You can't tell whether the distance of the car in front of you through a telescope, it's going to look 2.2 times closer. Can't use it for that. And they are legal in California. You just can't use them to read the chart at DMV. Other states, Ohio, has a long list of things that you have to accomplish in order to prove that you can use the bioptics safely. Every state is different. Ultimately, we can make a safe driver safer, cannot make an unsafe driver safe. So the telescope system is placed above the visual axis. In this case, I actually gave her a bifocal. She was going to drive with them. She was going to try and get her license, and she ultimately did, but she also needed to read, and so I put a bifocal in there. This gentleman, this is a, the same 2.2, only he just felt constricted with it. He wanted a wider field of view, so I gave him a wider field of view. They do come. This lady here on the left is a minus 12 and a very tiny little lady. So I had to put it in a very small frame and I had to give her a very small, what's called a micro telescope, actually focusable. Again, she's driving. Again, her minus 12s are in the telescopes. And afterwards, she wrote me a letter and she wrote me and she gave me a list of 14 things she could now do with her telescope glasses that she couldn't do before. <laughs> One of them being cutting her toenails. I didn't want to do a visual in my brain about that, but that was on her list. It was really amazing. All the vision requirements we put on our organizational website. So if you need to get the vision requirements, um, you could go to ILVS, International Academy of Low Vision Specialists.com, <clears throat> and they're all there. And we try and keep them updated. It's very, very difficult to do that. Um, the very first time I put together this list of every state was back in the late 90s. And I literally had to call the state capital DMV in every state and get them to fax me the actual requirements. It was not an easy task. It took one year to gather it all. And we update it now every year. So the information is there. It's really interesting in California. I've asked optometrists and ophthalmologists what do you think the minimum vision requirement is? They have no idea. And they're telling, I've had patients tell me, well, my doctor said I don't meet the requirements. And they're 2070 or 2080 or 2100. And they stop driving. And they're terrified that they don't know how they're going to be independent. You're giving them false information. So you should absolutely know the vision requirements in your state. <clears throat> okay, so going back to the 12th step, 8, 9, and 10 are the three different distances that you're working with with the patient's wish list. Then we have stop and talk number two, where I go through it with them and explain everything. I thought I had a video on that for you. So what do I do? I review the wish list. What is and isn't possible? what the glasses will and won't do. I can't tell you how many times I've prescribed a bioptic for a patient who said they want to see better at a distance. 
they rejected the reading glasses that I came up with, whether it's a telescope or microscope or pi plus lenses, whatever. They come back to pick up the bioptic telescopes for distance. And the first thing they do is say, okay, give me a newspaper. Let me see if I can read. And it doesn't matter how many times I tell them what the glasses are for, what they will do and what they won't do. And that's why I always want somebody else in the room. So I give them the benefits, the limitations, what they can do, how long it's gonna take for them to get used to them. And then I present the costs. And number 12, shut up and listen. Let them ask questions, let them decide. Um, what I've learned in my practice is to give them one price. I don't tell them, okay, your telescope glasses are this much for driving, your near glasses are gonna be this much, um, and then your painting glasses are gonna be this much, and the frame is this much and that much, <clears throat> because I noticed that people get very antsy because they don't know when I'm going to stop talking and telling them how much it's going to be. So I don't do that. What I do is I just figure it all out and say, look, it's all going to cost you $4,000, $5,000, $3,000, and then shut up. Let them talk. Can I get one pair now, one pair later? Yes, you can. Well, I want to see how one pair works better. I said, well, that's like saying I'm going to buy the hat, and if the hat works, then I'm going to buy the shoes. They're two completely different things. What do you want to be able to do? This is, you know, you're saved for a rainy day. This is the rainy day. My job is to sell the help, not pressure. I never force anybody to do anything, and I shut up and listen. <clears throat> I'm listening for what has been absorbed. What do they really understand from all of this? Also, I'm also listening for what the spouse or the daughter is hearing over there. I need to know whether that person over there is friend or foe. Are they there because they want that person to do better to see better, to be more independent, to be happier? Or are they there against the patient? Oh, she won't use it. She's not going to use it. Why bother? If I sense that they're supportive, I may leave the room and say, listen, you guys talk, discuss, decide what you want to do. I'll be back in a few minutes. I'm going to check my messages. If I think that they're a foe, I'm not going to. So I had a patient who desperately wanted to drive, continue driving, desperately wanted to see street signs, road signs, absolutely. And the husband, I, so I said to the husband, do you have any thoughts on the matter? And he said, yeah, I think we should go back to the ophthalmologist and talk to him first. I looked at the patient and I said, you want to drive now? Or do you want to wait and go back to the other doctor? And her answer was very simple. Get them from me. I want to drive now. So you have to really assess the room. It's really low vision is more about managing the patient than anything else. And I speak to them about quality of life because that's what it's all about. Quality of life. Again, Jane Russell. That's what I fit her with. 1.7 telescope with the cap so she could read. We'll just go quickly through some of these. Female, 12 years old, star guards, seventh grade. That was one of the pictures you might've seen. Five over 40, five over 100, retina scope. What did I give her? I gave her prismatics to be able to do some reading and writing. High plus to read small print, 1.7 full diameter and 2.2. All right, we're running out of time, so I'm going to go through this faster. This is the lady with <clears throat> playing poker. She was happy. This is the 14 things that the lady who had the minus 12s sent me. See color details of hummingbirds at 10 feet. 
easily perform pedicure, see spider webs to clean from 12 feet, corners in the home, et cetera, et cetera. And yes, people will hold it very close if they want to read. Okay, so more optometrists are needed to do low vision. It's as simple as that. There are, well, I'm going to show you. There are approximately 8 million people in the United States that are visually impaired. And if you want to find your state in this list, do that. And that tells you the amount of visually impaired people are in your state. Arizona, 175,600 people. How many low vision doctors are in Arizona? Not enough. It doesn't matter what state you look at, there are not enough low vision doctors to take care of the amount of people. And it's rising because we're all getting older and more macular degeneration is happening. We need more doctors.